Uh, what am I saying? This is MPW, 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 MPW the podcast with your host, Zylo Aria. Cool. A podcast about music production for the everyday musician, where we learn from experienced studio engineers and each other. Jeannie Montalvo is a Grammy-nominated audio engineer and radio producer. As the NYC EQL resident at Spotify Studios, she assisted in the recording process for artists like Michael Bublé, John Legend and loads more. She has worked as an audio engineer and producer for National Public Radio, the Duolingo Podcasts and also for Sony and the New York Times. Lovely chatting to you today, Jeannie, and it's great to have you on the episode. And we will jump into our getting to know you section. And just to get straight into it, can you tell us a random fact about yourself? Maybe something that not a lot of people know or anything of that sort. Well, my random fact is actually that I used to ballroom dance and not like just ballroom dance, but I actually used to teach. I wasn't by in any <laughs> case of the sense since ballroom dancing is big. I'm, I wasn't like, so you think you can dance like that. But I taught through Arthur Murray, the Arthur Murray system. And so, you know, they train you to teach. I had danced growing up, um, Latin dancing. And then uh, I just kind of branched into that. And that uh, I used to call myself the dancing audio engineer because I was always kind of like dancing behind the console and stuff. <laughs> So that is my random I fact. I love that. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. That's great. And what kind of Latin dancing were you doing before then? Uh, my parents are Dominican, so I grew up with merengue and salsa pretty much. So oh, those were the, love it. The, 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 that was the music that I grew up with and, and you know, family events and, and there was always lots of dancing. So That's so cool. I actually uh, do a bit of salsa um, as well. And I, I've just wondered like families that come from that background is it that like every family function everyone's just dancing because that just seems like the most fun gathering ever <laughs> it is yeah everybody dances usually there's always people who don't of course but there's always lots of drinks and there's always lots of music and and good times and good vibes and stuff like that so <laughs> that sounds excellent that's great <laughs> I, i'm ready for more of that to come back so we're yeah. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Soon. Soon. Slowly but surely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then going to a bit of time travel, is there any event in your life that you feel like you would change or if not change any particular event that you feel like you've learned the most from in your life? The thing is, is like, I, I'm very much a proponent of that. Everything in my life has led me to where I am. So on one level, I'm like, no. And then, you know, I remember interviewing um, someone who was really into sci-fi and they were like, you can't because it messes with the time continuum. And that would just, you know, that would create a ripple effect and ruin everything. So like, no, okay. but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do in undergrad at all when I went to college. Like I had zero idea. And when I look back, I kind of just chose languages to major in. And I did minors in music and minors in mass communication because I knew music was a big part of my life. And I knew that I really liked communications and I <laughs> had taken enough electives to make a <laughs> mass communications minor. But the semester before I was about to graduate, I was going to graduate early. I spoke to my parents um, and I was like, I want to change my major to radio television. And my dad was like, no, you're done. We're not spending any more money. And, you know, like, it just was like, okay, so I guess that's the end <laughs> of my undergrad journey. And, you know, in retrospect, it I, I often wonder, like, what it would have been like if I had realized at the time or or been able to change my major and or realized it up front that that's what I wanted to study because I ended up <laughs> in radio and I often wonder what my trajectory would have been if I had started so much sooner I mean arguably the like big podcast boom is now so like I landed where I needed to land at the time and and stuff but I've, sometimes I've always like played that over in my head like what would have been like if if that had been different but yeah, here we are. Okay, 
Yeah, yeah. Good to kind of reflect on that. And and it, interesting, you mentioned that you started off in like a languages background as well. And I saw that you work on the uh, Duolingo podcast, which is an interesting kind of uh, combination of the two of the languages and the kind of audio side of things. And I listened to so much of that podcast, which is great. <laughs> You know, it's funny. That was the first time in my life that I felt like my past and my present had overlapped because my major was French and I've never done like what I've, I've never done anything with it, um, except for the fact that I was obsessed with French music and French literature and French culture. And, you know, I was just about to start working on the French Duolingo podcast. And I was like, oh, my goodness, it's all coming together because I was doing the Spanish language. And then the pandemic hit and I had to cut back to part time because I have a kid and it just it became too much to juggle. And that was the thing that like I just didn't have enough time to juggle Duolingo and the Futuro work that I was doing with Futuro Media. So it just I had to kind of like make a choice. And unfortunately, that was the one to go. But I was super bummed because I was like, ah, now I'm going to get to do the French language podcast and I, you know, get to use my French and well, yeah, things happen. So okay. it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Maybe it'll come back around somehow. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And if you were on a desert island and you could only pick three songs or albums to bring with you, what would they be? Definitely Love by the Beatles. Or not by the Beatles, but the remix that they did for Cirque du Soleil, the surround sound. I feel like I had a religious experience the first time I heard it in surround sound. If I could find a uh, comp a Motown compilation, I would take that with me with lots of Stevie Wonder um, and lots of oldies and uh, something in Spanish, either something by Juan Luis Guerra or uh, Shakira, but like old Shakira, like brunette Shakira, not blonde Shakira. Okay. <laughs> not that I dislike blonde Shakira, but I I miss her like singer songwriter roots. So okay. no pun intended. Okay. I don't think I've heard <laughs> any of that actually. It's really great. Really great. Cool. All right. I'll have to check it out. And what is the first thing that you do in the morning and the last thing you do at night? I now have two kids, so <laughs> the first thing that I do in the morning is usually get woken up by a small person <laughs> <laughs> at an hour that people shouldn't be waking up at. <laughs> okay, and the okay. last thing I do at night is I take a shower. It doesn't matter what time it is. It's just like I, it's kind of a ritual and, and being a mom kind of like it's my moment to have a little bit of me time. <laughs> So it's just kind of like, oh, it's a really great way for me to unwind um, and then just get to bed feeling fresh. That's great. I think it's really important to have these things that you do maybe just before you sleep or something. And I, I feel like I'm learning the importance of it myself to actually have a good sleep because I'm always checking your phone or something just before bed. It just ruins the whole night for me, I've realized. So, mm -hmm. so that's good. Good to have that. And who has been your greatest role model, would you say? I feel like I'm split with my role models, right? So, you know, logic should tell me that my role model should be a woman because I'm a woman in a technical field. But right off the bat, I think the person that's been like a huge mentor for me and has really supported me in everything that I've done is, is um, Andreas Meyer. He's an engineer, an engineer here in New York uh, that works in classical music, is a mastering engineer. After my first job, he kind of took me under his wing and I was his assistant and I learned so, so much from him. And then he's also just super duper duper supportive of everything. He's always been really fair pay. He also employs a lot of women, which is <laughs> really great. All his assistants after me have been women. He's he's really been like influential in, in my career. And even like when I have ideas and crazy things and he lets me use the studio and stuff like that and gives me good rates and things. So that's on the uh, just general mentoring side. But I think as a role model more akin to where I am in my life, my advisor at NYU, Agnieszka Riginska, who was president of the Audio Engineering Society for a bit. But um, she's got two kids and, you know, she's been heavily influential in the 3D audio world, doing research and stuff and, and you know, running her department at um, NYU. I've always kind of like a sat on her couch and been like, why am I not getting jobs? <laughs> um, but also like, you know, something to aspire to. Like, you know, she's she's done it all. She's a mom. She's working and she's never let go of what she's wanted to do. So 
both those people sound great. And yeah, it's so great to have someone like that in your life, especially for me, just seeing people like yourself as well, like being a mum and doing this stuff is just superhuman stuff, which is <laughs> awesome and, and great to see that it's possible. So I'm sure you're also a role model in that way for so many uh, women in the industry. I hope. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Getting into your career as a radio producer, can you tell me what does a typical day look like for you at work? It kind of depends on what we're doing. So, I mean, I'm, I'm currently senior producing, which means that I kind of like oversee a lot. So for me, a typical day could be crunching the calendar and making sure that our production timeline is on schedule. If we need to adjust things, if, if edits are happening when they're supposed to edit, if people are delivering their pieces when they're supposed to deliver them um, so that we can meet the target release dates and stuff like that. Sometimes it's, you know, researching a lot of research for our next project or researching for a script or maybe it's writing a script. And then, you know, on the on the back end of that, the post-production side is a lot of assemblies, um, getting a script and then just putting all the narration together, adding music where you think there should be music and adding sound effects where you think there should be sound effects and and then just polishing and making sure that everything sounds pretty. <laughs> okay, that sounds fair. And how would you describe your working style? And is there a particular style that kind of lends itself well to your job? I think for my job, it's just having attention to detail and being organized, making lists, when you're overseeing a lot of projects or like being pulled in a lot of directions, things tend to get scattered and it's easy for stuff to fall through the cracks if you don't like write stuff down and put things on the calendar and, you know, just keep really detailed and organized file management, making sure your audio is all in the same place and where it's supposed to be, especially when you're kind of working on a team, like it's not enough just to bounce your file and name it a certain thing like you have to put it in the right folder so that the next person can pick it up you know if I'm done sound designing a project I have to put it where it goes so that engineering can then pick it up and download it and mix it so you know if files are missing from your audio files folder then the next person that picks it up your your things aren't your, nothing's going to link so it, it becomes really important to kind of make sure that you're paying attention to where you're putting stuff and where you're you're keeping and, and managing all your files. Okay. So in a way, it sounds like you're kind of a project manager in some capacities. Are there any tools or systems that you use to make sure that things run the way you would like them to? I think because as you're working on a team, it's good to be personable. <laughs> it's good to be nice. <laughs> so it's good to check in on people and to see, you know, where they are. It's good to have check-ins in general, just to like meet with everybody and, and kind of know where everything is at. I personally make lists and assign myself tasks, you know, especially if, if you tend to be a little bit anxious, making lists helps. Sometimes things feel like it's a lot in your head, but if you write it down, it's like, oh, it's only a couple of things. I can get this done in, in an hour, you know? So sometimes it's just about kind of writing it down and then being able to cross stuff off that list as you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. The very traditional <laughs> list. I love traditional. it. Traditional. Can't yes. go wrong. <laughs> exactly. Can't go wrong with a list. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love them. Love them. That's great. And are there any particular challenges that you might encounter on a daily basis? And do you have a, a method to deal with them? I mean, the main challenges are, are if, you know, if things get behind as they probably will. Things happen in life. We're all human. So you can't really predict what the human experience is going to be like. You know, for instance, I was, I personally was producing a story in February and the whole house got COVID. And so it was like, you know, we just kind of, we still had a deadline because we still had an air date because we really wanted to target Women's History Month. So I didn't have too, too much flexibility aside from the fact that like, stuff needed to be flexible and we had to push stuff back. So that was that. <laughs> but um, having a level of flexibility to be able to move stuff, but also make sure that you hit your deadlines is a very fine balancing act. I think those are, are kind of the most challenging moment is kind of like 
when stuff seems like it's sort of falling apart in terms of scheduling and things like that to just kind of sit back and look at the bigger picture and um, be able to figure out, okay, this is the crisis. This is what's happening. How are we going to manage it and how are we going to fix it? So those kind of things. And because I tend to be more hands-on, especially like when I'm producing a story myself and I want to sound design it and stuff, it's just a matter of like <laughs> zooming out and figuring out, okay, this is what I want to happen. How am I going to make that happen? Okay. And going into the actual radio production, would you say that there are any keys to great sounding radio production? Um, I think the first step I mean, as, as in any audio field, is to make sure that the first source of your audio is great sounding audio. So your mic, your your recording setup has to be great because you can't have a good podcast if your audio sounds bad. I mean, you can't have a movie, arguably, with bad audio either. <laughs> but with podcasts, you don't have anything to see. So you are, you're using your ears. So if what you're hearing doesn't sound good, then you have nothing to work with. So, uh, I mean, that's been hard in remote circumstances because a lot of audio doesn't sound great. But uh, I think if you work to get the best source audio, the very first point in the chain, which is your microphone and your your host or, or whatever is recording, that's first. And then having the best quality uh, music file, making sure that that sounds good, making sure that if you're using sound effects, that your sound effects files sound good, that they're the best quality that you can work with. And then when you put it all together, finding ways so that it's they kind of like ebb and flow together so that your voice is loud enough and the music isn't distracting, but that the music is kind of also making you enjoy the programming. Okay. I feel like I'm going to be very nervous when I send you the edit of this uh, podcast. (laughs) Never, never. I uh, will suspend my disbelief. (laughs) I will will pretend I know nothing. (laughs) Great. That's perfect. (laughs) Okay. And are there any specific pieces of work uh, or, or one in particular that you're really proud of that you've worked on in your career? And were there specific difficulties that you experienced during that process and how did you overcome them? I think the one that's kind of like been closest to my heart is probably the the one that I just told you about that I worked on in February that was... Um, about Maria Griever, a Mexican composer from the 1930s. It, I think it was one of the most rewarding stories that I've worked on. Um, I think for a lot of reasons. For one, because I just kind of identified with her because she was this Latina woman with two kids um, living in New York. And, you know, she was a composer at a time that I'm not a composer, but she was a woman working in a music and audio field trying to make her way in this giant city. And, you know, she wrote some of the greatest songs of our history. Like she wrote What a Difference a Day Makes. And so going back and kind of digging into her history, which wasn't easily found on the internet. So I really had to dig. And I ended up after a lot of digging, uh, finding her family, like her, you know, distant relatives and being able to speak more with her about her legacy. And because I pitched a series about women in music, it kind of made me think about the legacy that we leave as women and these women in the history have left and how we're remembered and how sometimes women are painted unfairly because of certain things and they're labeled as difficult or whatever. And so it's, I kind of feel like that's been the most rewarding story to work on. And just like everything came together really beautifully. Like the production came together really beautifully. I used a lot of really, like we have a sound library, um, a music library, which, you know, arguably sometimes has really cheesy music, but I just was able to find really like niche 1930s-esque music, a lot of kind of like vaudeville feeling kind of music. So it really kind of set the time and the place really well. I wasn't able to find as much archival because it was the 1930s. 
but I found newspaper clippings. So I became creative of how we reported that. So I had one of our staff do like an old New York accent and I EQ'd it and like made it sound old timey and like added a typewriter effect. So it sounded like an old newspaper and stuff. So I kind of just got creative on how we delivered that. And I had one of my co-producers read her interviews and things like that. So it just kind of was really rewarding, especially because like in the middle of it, I got COVID. And so it was just um, when it all came together, it was really rewarding and satisfying. So yes. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. And yeah, such a great uh, project to be a part of. And taking us to our last question, which is an audience question from uh, Ramira Abraham, who's actually a great uh, vocal producer herself. And she asked, do you find the nature of working in radio more structural than working in music? Yes and no. I mean, everything has deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Music is going to get released on certain dates. And so you have to meet those deadlines. Maybe the creative process is a little more flexible in music. Like if you're not inspired or if the artist isn't inspired to do something one day, then they won't be able to do it. And then you have to adjust accordingly. But in radio, it's like this is your deadline and you kind of have to meet it regardless. Thus, you know, working through COVID. So like... Maybe it's a little bit more structured, but I feel like at the end of the day, like that everything has an air date and has a release date. So like you kind of have to be structured in certain ways. And, you know, it's, I, ironically enough, working in radio helped me in my music work. I'm really bad with lyrics. I feel like there's two kind of people who listen to music. There's the people who focus on the melody and then there's the people who focus on the lyrics. And I am 100 percent melody, maybe 99 percent me melody. Like <laughs> sometimes I listen to lyrics. But I feel like it helped me more with production on the production end of music because I started to think more about lyrics as stories and the melody as stories. And so whereas I was sound designing in my radio work where I knew, OK, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the pacing as the pacing goes of this narration and I need to create a window for X, Y, Z sound effect to happen or something like that. That started to seep into my music work because then I would say, okay, I need uh, this amount of bars because I need to create a window for this trumpet solo or something like that. Like it started to help me think of music more narratively. And I think that was something that was missing for me originally. And so now I think of them, them all as stories and it's, it's kind of really helped me like think of it that way. And so... Okay, that's lovely. Actually, talking about your music as well, you've been nominated for a Grammy twice for your work in music audio specifically. And do you remember where you were when you heard about that nomination? And can you describe how that feels? It's weird because they didn't really feel real. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. It was my thesis project, so I was in school. So I remember Bobby getting the nomination for Best Latin Jazz and like being super thrilled. But like because it, I mean, I wasn't it wasn't my album. It wasn't my like it didn't. I just kind of was like excited for him. I do remember being super jazzed about that. Um, no pun intended. Actually, pun intended. Maybe <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the second time when that was like, you know, more direct for the mastering work we did on, on Vladimir Horowitz, like, again, I don't really remember where I was, but I remember that I was like, oh, this is happening. Oh, this is real. Oh. And then it was just kind of a scramble, like, are we going to go? Are we going to go? And then I, it kind of just became like, okay, this could, hopefully this is not a once in a lifetime opportunity, but we are going to go. Um, and then I was eight weeks pregnant when we went actually. And so it kind of was a fun moment. I mean, we hadn't told anybody yet. So it was just kind of like a secret, but you know, we were going to this big event. It just felt special in that way because I, uh, you know, I had always wondered like if my audio career would allow me to be a mom and to have a family and stuff. So like getting to go to the Grammys and being eight weeks pregnant was kind of like a really cool moment for me as a as a woman and be like, oh look, I can I can I can do this. It's okay. <laughs> So jumping into our little speed quiz, get ready for it. Super I'm quick ready. answers. Okay. <laughs> All right. Piano or synth? Piano. Mac or PC? Mac. Quality or vibe? Ooh, vibe. Digital or analog? Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh analog i guess analog okay <laughs> <laughs> this one was specifically for you Jenny. okay uh, listening or dancing no that's <laughs> not fair dancing while listening <laughs> <laughs> that's cheating <laughs> that's uh, fine that's fine i'll give it to you <laughs> i mean can, arguably it's like the tree that falls in the forest does somebody hear it like can you dance without music that does exist there i have read about that but like if there's no listening there is no dancing so you can't have one okay the all right so you found a little <laughs> hole a little in pole. this uh in this quiz but that's okay <laughs> So we'll give you that one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Cool. So just on the last bit on the top tip. So can you give us your one top career tip? Never be afraid to ask for something. You never know if the person is going to say no. It could be getting a job. It could be shadowing. It could be whatever. It could be negotiating more pay. It could be asking to, to for a gig. Like the worst thing that they're going to say is no, but being afraid of the no is um, you'll have more regret of not asking. Yeah. Love that. Definitely agree. Okay. And the second one is what is your one top self-care tip? Movement, uh, whether it's the gym or whatever if you're super bogged down super stuck super working like on massive deadlines and and try not to get burnt out just like walk away take a walk try to get like the blood flowing so that you can it kind of like clears your mind a little bit i should take my own self care tips but, <laughs> but that is my <laughs> self care tip <laughs> That's good. That's good. So you'll you'll take a walk after this, yeah? <laughs> I, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. That's great. And the last one, what is your top just general life tip? Don't forget you. I think it's easy to lose sight of who you are and and you know what you may have wanted in life because it moves very quickly and and Sometimes you are doing a million things and, and then you forget maybe what your original essence or what your original plans were or what you really loved and what you aspired to do. Make sure you check in with yourself sometimes. I mean, that kind of goes back to self-care, but make sure to check in with yourself to remind yourself like, you know, these are the things that I love and these are the things that I want to do. And so that's my general life tip. Here are my biggest three takeaways from Jeannie. So the first one was to start with quality audio and it seems you can never fix something as much as if you get the audio as good as possible uh, right from the start. And my second takeaway is that things always seem a lot bigger in your head until you write them down. So to make the most of writing lists. And my third takeaway was to not be scared to ask. And it seems that, uh, you know, you never know if someone is going to say yes to something that you might need help with. So don't be scared to put yourself out there. That's it from us. I hope you enjoyed the episode and see you in two weeks.